now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen you to the mountains, to the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And from Shittim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take the light in thousands of rams in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. I don't know what got me started on it, but I was giving some thought to the history of the church. And you know that politicians, statesmen, statesmen, and historians always want to know what history is going to say about us. Well, if no human being is around, history is not going to say a thing. And so perhaps it's more important that we ask the question, what is the Lord going to say about us? But what history does say, I still worry. Athanasius, the great Christian apologist, when the odds were against him, they developed a bumper sticker, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world as he stood for the case of the Trinity, imprisoned, beaten, but nevertheless held firm. And we can see some great outstanding watermarks of what our brothers and sisters before us have done and how they've done it and sometimes with great sacrifice. And then I come to the 20th century and I say, what is history going to say about the 20th century? Oh, I know, how many churches did we split over the kind of songs we sing? Whether we stand up, sit down, or clap our hands. And I do hope that there's more to the 20th and the 21st century than that, but I know that that will be a part of it. And I, sure that I am sure that there is more. And that will be good. But giving some account to what has happened over the last few decades as to whether or not we should sing songs of such a nature or that nature, or in all of these little things, you finally step back and say, so what? Let's not swallow the camel and strain at the gnat. Let's make sure that we have our priorities in place. Let's be sure that we do not hassle over the cumin and the dill and forget about the greater principles by which we should live our lives. So let's forget some of these things for now. And let's reaffirm our own commitment to true priorities. Be it resolved that we know and practice true worship. Therefore, be it further resolved that we worship our God by doing justice, by loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. Notice we are not to seek justice. We already know what it is as believers. 
We're to do it. We're to be practitioners. And Micah says, He, meaning the Lord, has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. To have clearly in front of you the norms and the principles of justice and to live a just life providing that which is right for oneself and one's neighbor and for one's country and for one's congregation. This is the primary requirement of the people of God, to be able to come into the house of worship and look back over the past week and say, Lord, by your grace, I have done a rather decent job of living justly. And understand, to live justly in the 21st century means that we will be out of step with our culture because we are to live by our feelings. And of course, that becomes a power grab. If my feelings reign supreme in my life, they should reign supreme in yours too. But God's word says that there are greater values at stake than one's feelings. Remember now, it's been at least 50 years since our university said there is no God to give us a law, and so we are free. There is no real conscience to give us a universal law or set of laws, so we are free. And there is nothing established within our nature to do the same. And my worry and my fear is when I hear many of our believers talk, when they speak of freedom of the will, they are talking like an existentialist philosopher and not like a Wesleyan or a Calvinist. There's a great difference. And so we need to forget a number of things and renew our commitment to those things that are basic and are of infinite and eternal value. And we are to seek justice in the course of one's life. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. You mean with all the stringed instruments and the drums and everything that is so much praiseworthy, you're not going to listen? But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We've all been by rippling streams. We've all been by flowing waters. And I should like to suggest to you that in this passage, that stands as a great picture for music to God's ears. And we should see to it that justice should roll down like the waters and the righteousness, like an everlasting, like an ever-flowing stream. Understand that God is more concerned with righteous living than he is with our forms of worship. And righteous living is clearly stated. Is there yet a man in the wicked house along with treasures of wickedness in a short measure that is cursed? There needs to be an accurate measure of grain, the prophet tells the people. The scales must truly balance. The balanced scale is music to God's ears. Can I justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights? And that is not a question for debate. That is a rhetorical question. The answer is clear. I cannot justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights. Righteous living is an accurate measure of grain. It is a balanced scale, and it is a city 
that is safe from violence and character assassination. For the rich men of the city are full of violence, and her residents speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth, but notice that they can come. They can come with the noise of their songs. They can come to the sound of the harps. And God is deaf. And as we look to a new year, we should be resolved afresh and anew to live justly and righteously within our families, within our congregations, within our neighborhoods. There's where God is found. God is not found primarily in the tinkling of brass. And not only to do justice, but to love kindness. He has told you, old man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The Hebrew notion of love at best has emotion as a secondary idea. Its primary notion can be conveyed by such terms as commitment, loyalty, steadfastness. That is the definition of love by which God's people should live. For these same basic notions, commitment, loyalty, and steadfastness reappear again with great regularity in the New Testament. And notice what the love is for. The love is for kindness. For some time now, we've watched people speak of social justice and the like, and I tell you that that is a cold, hard concept without kindness. And that re refers to a faithfulness in relationships, first to God and then to man. What are the two great commandments that governed the Old Testament and the New? To love God with the totality of our beings and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that has little or nothing to do with an order of service. Faithfulness in relationships to God and to man and proper actions within those relationships. And using God as the watermark, as the standard, there is a support for those relationships. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love and he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all of their sins into the depths of the sea. There, there is the standard of what kindness is about. And God is the standard who is forgiving and who is passing in his anger and unchanging in his love. This is what he expects to see in the hearts and lives of his people as individuals and as congregations. And if there's going to be a renewal in our country, as we have said before, we're long past the revival. We need a reformation. And we should at least stand renewed once again to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. One of the greatest compliments that could be paid, particularly in the Old Testament, when it is said 
that say Noah walked with God. Abraham walked with God. And what that means by walking with God, that that person is living by the standards that God requires requests and that we want to do by love. It means to seek his will. It means to know his will. And it means to do his will. Some of you may be reading in the paper about one of our local justices of the peace who has been suspended for a while and I was really encouraged that the justice of a peace had to go take a basic course in ethics. <laughs> to me, I would think that to be a prerequisite. I would think that it would be understood that there is a clear understanding of moral principles and of a set of ethics that should be based upon those principles and drawn from them. And I really wonder what one course in, ang in anger management and basic ethics is going to do. You can teach anybody to be ethical, but you can't compel them. And we need to be sure that we are people who seek his will, to know his will, and above all else, to do it. To walk humbly with our God. To walk humbly at least says, Lord, you know me better than I know myself, but to the extent I know myself, I don't deserve to be in your company. And yet here I am. Thank you. It is a recognition of our own personal weakness. It is our recognition of the tendency to sin. It is a recognition of the total dependence upon God to live properly. These are the things that we should seriously look at and investigate and renew. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself down before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves, does the Lord take the light in thousands of rams and ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Does God care how high the church steeple is? Does God care how many camels traipse across a platform at Christmas time? Does God care about how tall the living Christmas tree is? If our hearts are not right before the Lord, he does not care about our orthodox practices. He does not care about the expense of our practices and the sacrificial nature of our practices. He sees no value to them. Instead, he is interested in only those whose hands are clean and their hearts are pure. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, 
He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The greatest blessing that we can receive first and foremost is the blessing of the righteousness that is not our own but comes from God in the person of Jesus Christ. Every other blessing flows to us through that agent and that instrument. Let's forget some of these trivial things. Let's be sure that we major in those important things and not in the minors. Let us be sure that when the questions and the issues arise, the first question we ask is, where does this fit on the scale of importance? Does this add to or take away from my loving of justice to do it and the loving of kindness and to walking humbly with my God? The thing that we all know is that God really does not need us to do anything in the work of the ministry. He gives us the privilege to represent him. And that should be the beginning of humility. As a congregation, these words are not judgmental. These words are a call for us to review who we are as individuals and who we are as a congregation. And by God's grace, we will. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you that you have made yourself open and available to us that we might walk by your side. You have not called us to your side to be your counselor or your guide. You have called us to your side that we might know infinite, eternal, and true blessing. You've called us to your side to be the best mentor that one could ever have in the issues of life. May we indeed be humbled. May our hearts and our lives be filled with thanksgiving. And may we seek out the best ways to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our